All right, Rabbi, I think we can start because we're trying to you know, keep everything running smoothly on time. So it's a pleasure to welcome back. I say we're not going to do big back. Back. Rabbi Israel. Rabbi many times. We'll start speaking. I think you need to unmute I'm going to have to meet you. But anyway, okay. Thank you. Okay, Rabbi Alex, you can get started. Okay. So I hope that everybody is um, fasting well or coping well with the fast. And certainly if you're here, you are engaged in a very appropriate uh, mode of marking um, this somber day. And uh, what I want to do, one of the things, uh, as you I'm sure all know, that the rabbis say that we're not really meant to be studying Torah on this day. This day is not for studying Torah, except for certain um, passages, which are um, appropriate for the day, which you are able to um, study because of their sadness. Uh, one of the famous ones that you all know, I'm sure, is the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. And this all comes from the Talmud in Gitin, uh, page 56, where there is a whole slew of different stories which narrate some of the horrors of what caused the calamity of the Khurban but also the, how should I call it, the sociological reality of Jerusalem um, during the period before the Khurban. And it's fascinating because a lot of these are about food. Uh, I know food is maybe something we don't want to think about so much, but if you think about, um, if you think about the idea of the Kamsa and Bar Kamsa story, it's about a celebration. It's about high society, High society. Can people hear me? Just want to make sure people can hear me. Yes, we can all hear you. I'm not sure what that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Absolutely. Okay. I just stories, okay. The stories are about high society. They're about food and maybe even more than that feasting. Think about the story of Kamsa Barakamsa. It's about invitations to a party. And why is this? Because there's going to be a focus on social status, on um, shaming, on we're going to see focus on, on gender, on prestige, on feasting, on fasting, on starving. These stories, instead of maybe taking the whole, imagine if you read a history book, you'd hear about the great revolt and what started in the year 66, and when the Romans came along and, and the year 70. Here we're going to tell small human stories. You know, it's actually something that we're used to from our, from our newscasting, that sometimes the news doesn't tell the big story anymore. It goes in and tells a particular story about a certain individual, a certain family, somebody who's experiencing some difficulty. And through that micro story, through that um, the micro politics of daily life, as somebody once called it, we can illuminate the complexities of the broader social tense uh, dimensions of disaster. And therefore, this is very clear in Kamsa Bar Kamsa, and food and wealth are going to come into this story in a very big way. And this is where I'm already going to jump in. Today, we're going to learn the story about a woman called Martha Bat Baitus. Um, she was called one of the wealthy people of Yerushalayim. That's her, her name in the story. And we're going to learn about her, her tragedy. And um, let's, I'm going to share my screen so that we can start already studying source sheets. Okay, so I hope people are with me and uh, can see the source sheet and uh, we're, we're in good shape. Um, I wanna start off with a story here, which um, is gonna tell a story about the power of the wealthy people of Jerusalem and maybe even uh, their piety. Let me explain what I mean here. Um, let's take a look at this story where we talk about Vespasian, the emperor, and maybe what we will do, or the Caesar as he's called, is uh, and maybe what we'll do is we'll read a little bit in uh, some of the Hebrew or the Aramaic and the English. So, Shadrei Lavelas Kesar 
Asar Tsar Alea Tzalat Shani. We have the notion that Vespasian has besieged Jerusalem for three years. And what do we hear at this point? We hear about three wealthy people, that there are Hanut Tzalat Atire, these three men of great wealth, and their names are Nachdimon Ben Gurion, Ben Kalda Savua, or Ben Sitzit Kesef. Okay, Nadimon Ben Gurion, Kalba Savua, and Ben Sisira Kesef. Why? Nadimon Ben Gurion, Shinatalo Hamab Abuo. This is a story that the sun continued shining for his sake. It's a story about Nadimon Ben Gurion who wanted to try and make sure that there was water for all of the people who came for Ali Al Regel. In other words, Nadimon Ben Gurion, and I assume that Ben Gurion, um, David Ben Gurion uh, of modern times, his name was actually Green, his family name, and he obviously decided to take on this name for this person being one of the famous leaders of Jerusalem before its destruction. And then we have Ben Kalba Sabua. And why? He was so wealthy that anybody goes, went to his house as a Kelev, as a hungry as a dog, came out Sabea, came out full. In other words, once again, Ben Kalba Sabua is somebody who is tremendously hospitable. And Tzitzit Akesef is called so because his Tzitzit would trail upon cushions. He, he had wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in his home. So we have a situation in which these are the wealthy people. And other people say that, no, it's not from that. It's that he got his name from the fact that his seat, his Kisei, was among the nobility of Rome. That he was somebody who used to be able to um, live in high society. And I'm giving you this whole backdrop in order to set the scene for Jerusalem and for understanding something about Jerusalem and the type of people we have here. Let's take this one stage further. And what did they do when we have this siege? How are they, these three people going to be involved in the siege? So if you keep, I'm going to read in the English here. I think it'll save us a lot of time. And uh, we not, don't have so much time. One of them said to the people of Jerusalem, I will pay, keep the people in wheat and barley. In other words, I can pay for all the grain in this city. A second said, I will keep them in wine, oil, and salt. The third said, I will keep them in wood. So we've basically got possibilities have grain, wine, oil, salt, and even wood for heating. And the rabbis considered the offer of wood the most generous. Whichever way, the important line here, I'll just scroll up a little bit, is these men were in a position to keep the city for 21 years. We all know that part of the um, strategy of armies who are besieging a city is that they hope that the city will run out of supplies and they will be able to thereby vanquish the city. And here we find that these wealthy people were capable and willing to support the city and to leave the city for 21 years. We also know that Jerusalem had all sorts of water stores and what have you. But here we go. Now we're going to see a different machlokas. The Birioni, the zealots, were in the city. The rabbi said, let's go make peace with the Romans. The zealots wouldn't let them. On the contrary, they said, let's go fight them. The rabbi said, you won't succeed. So what did they do? They rose up and burnt the stores of wheat and barley so that a famine would ensue. And what are we seeing here? We're seeing the idea, and sometimes this indeed is the notion that... Um, um, we, we see the notion that the city really could have survived, could have survived for a long time, but um, we were the ones, the Jewish people, who are infighting and our ideological battles between the rabbis who seem to have been willing to make a compromise and between the zealots who weren't willing to make a compromise. These were people that we're the ones where we say that Sinat Chinam, that the infighting was something which brought us down. I think we're referring to events such as this, where it was actually our people, our own people who burnt the storehouses of Jerusalem. 
and thereby brought the city. And a feature, I'm sure you know, of Eicha is that the idea of starvation in the city, the children and the mothers with their, with their babies and not being able to even feed their babies, the, the, the uh, merciful women who had to even resort to eating the flesh of their dead children, the idea of starvation and famine, which eventually, and then the death, which brought pandemic and, 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 and illness to the city, all of this brought the city down. Why did it happen? Because of political fights between the extremists on the right, between the people on the left, and eventually we brought about our own demise. So this is one of the features of the story. And now we're going to hone in on one particular story here of one very wealthy lady. Martha Baitus Atirata Tirushalayim Hadi. She was, if you want, the most wealthy woman of Jerusalem. She sent her servant and said, Zil Aitili Samina, please bring me some fine flour. Ada Azil, there were famine. By the time he went to the store, it, it was sold out. Ata Marley, Smida Leka, Hibarta Ika. There's no fine flour, but there's white flour. She said, bring it. You know, I'll, I'll skip to the English and maybe that'll help us. Okay. She says, there's no fine, fine flour, there's white flour. So he said, she, said to, she said to him, go bring me some. By the time he went, he found the white flour sold out. He came and told her, there's no white flour, there's dark flour. She said to him, go bring me some. By the time he went, it was sold out. He returned and said to her, there's no dark flour, but there's barley flour. She said, go bring me some. By the time he went, this was also sold out. She had taken off her shoes, but she said, I will, now by the way, until now, this almost sounds like a comedy of errors, right? There's a whole type of humor where you have wealthy people who have a bumbling servant and the bumbling servants, right, kind of get it right. Uh, you know, I don't know, some of you might remember 40 Towers with Manuel. And you have these uh, situations where this is a classic type of comedy. This is a very, very black comedy, as we will see in the uh, next line. She'd taken off her shoes and she said, I'll go out and see if I can find anything to eat. And as she went out into the street, some dung that stuck to her foot and she died. Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai applied to her this verse. She who is most tender and delicate among you, so tender and dainty that she would never venture to set foot on the ground. And this is from Devarim chapter 28. So we're going to look at this in a moment. So that's one version. But how did Marta pass away? She passed away because she was in the situation of being um, so shocked, this aristocratic woman whose foot had never stepped foot on the ground. Suddenly she sticks her foot into a pile of manure, right? The shock literally killed her. And in fact, I was just reading today, this morning, some of the accounts from the Holocaust from various, the first deportations of the German Jews, the Jews from Prague, and many of these people who had been, were the first people to be deported were in fact people, professionals, aristocracy, and they talk about the number of people who committed suicide on the trains, on the cattle cars, because just the thought of being in these squalid, awful conditions was something that they just couldn't even fathom. Right? It was maybe the hardy Jews who survived the Holocaust. But these aristocratic Jews didn't even last the awful, hot, parched train ride. And so many of them, she took their own lives. So that's one of the versions. Some report a different version. She ate a fig left by Rabbi Sadok and became sick and died. For Rabbi Sadok observed fast for 40 years in order that Jerusalem might not be destroyed. And he became so thin that when he ate anything, the food could be seen as it passed through his throat. He was always fasting, but when he wanted to restore himself, they would bring him a fig and he would suck the juice and throw the rest away. And again, what happened? She ran into the street. She didn't have any bread because the bread was all sold out. And she picked up a fig, a fig which was already a second-hand fig, and she became sick and died. Interestingly, the thing which kept 
Rabbi Tzadok alive killed her. When Martha was about to die, she brought out all her gold and silver and threw it in the street, saying, what good is this to me? As in the verse from Ezekiel, they cast their silver in the street. So this, at some level, is a terrible tale of woe, which wants to maybe give us a glimpse into the tragedy of Jerusalem through its aristocracy, through the, the, the how is she called here? The tender and dainty, the tender and delicate, and we see the tragedy by seeing these well-heeled uh, people of, uh, and some of you might have visited in Jerusalem, the burnt house or the archeology span under Yeshiva Kotel, And you see the mansions of the people in Jerusalem. And we now know pretty much that probably Martha Baitus was probably one of those people because that neighborhood was a neighborhood of, high, of, of priests. And soon we're going to see that Martha Benbaitus wasn't just married to a priest. She was, in fact, married to the high priest himself. So on your source sheet, there's a whole source of sort of questions because I actually prepared this source sheet for a session where we were going to have Chavruta. But I want to read this story. I call this Martha Benbaitus um, text and subtext. And I want to read this two ways. The first way I want to read this is as a classic tale of tragedy. And I think there are many sources which read it that way. And if we're going to see it in this regard, um, I think what we, what we want to see is um, the source text that they bring here, which I'm gonna highlight right now, um, is the source text of that, that line which says, the tender and delicate among you who never feet and never touch the soil. Um, here, it's right over here. So what's going on there? What is that text? And again, it, unfortunately, the text stretches from the top of page. And maybe I'll make it a little smaller. This will help us. The text is from Devarim chapter 28. And chapter 28 is, in fact, the Tochacha. The Torah tells us that if we follow the laws of the Torah, we will have blessing. But if we reject the laws of the Torah, we will have all sorts of curse. And let's take a look at how we're going to read this. The Lord will bring a nation from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down. The nation you will not recognize their, their language. They'll devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you're destroyed. They will leave you no grain, no wine, no wine or no, no oil. They'll lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. So we've got the notion here, of course, of the devastation of the countryside, right? A foreign invasion. The siege, right, which of course we know from Asar Abateveit and Shiva Asim Tamuz, and now getting even more frightening. Um, it talks about because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege, you will eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters that the Lord has given you, right? This is Vachalta Prebit Mecha, Besar Banecho Brotecha, Shenatanacha, Shemalokecha, Bamatsar of Matsok Ashir, Sikacha Ivecha the most terrifying, horrific scenes. And then even talks about how even the most gentle and sensitive man among you will have no compassion on his brother or his wife, the wife that he loves or surviving children. He will not give any of them the flesh of his children that he's eating. It will be all he has left because of his suffering. And now if the men, men aren't compassionate, that's one thing. But now the most gentle, sensitive women among you so sensitive and gentle, they would not venture to touch the ground with the sole of their foot will begrudge the husband she loves and her son and daughter. So the Midrash in Gittin tells this terrible story of this woman who, by the way, if you understand the story, right, she goes and tells her servant, go get me fine flour, because that's what she's used to eating. He comes back and he's like, oh gosh, she doesn't eat anything but fine flour. She goes, okay, then white flour. She can't even imagine, she doesn't just say, go get everything, go get whatever there is. She can't imagine eating 
the white flour. Then she says, maybe brown flour, maybe barley. In the end, everything's right. It gives you a sense that once the food runs out, it runs out so fast. She's got no time to adjust. She's got no time to adjust. And a woman who's used to eating fine flour then is in a situation when she eventually her dainty foot meets this pile of dung in the street. The shock is so intense. Um, by the way, all of this is described by Sefer Barim. In Lord Tishmor Torah Hazot. It's all a punishment for not keeping the Torah. Um, now again, we ask ourselves, who is this woman, Marta Bat Vitus? And here we go to see in Eicha Rabba another story, um, which gives us, helps us understand. And we're going to see a different version, a third version of her death. Okay, so we're going to have to wonder what exactly is the true story of her death. We've already had two versions. Version number one, she put her foot in a pile of manure. Number two, she was so hungry, she ate a fig that Rabbi Tzadok had sucked, and that made her sick. And the third story we'll read now. But let's see. Ma'aseh b'miram b'maitus. Here we go. Ma'aseh, this is from Eicha Rabba, which again, we're also allowed to read on uh, this day. Um, one second. I'm just looking at the, I'm not going to be able to look at the uh, chat in real time. It's just a bit too much for me to cope with. I'll take a look at it at the end. We have a story about this woman. Her Hebrew name apparently is Miriam. So it's interesting that she's referred to um, as somebody who is, has a Hebrew name and she has a Roman name. Marta Miriam, Shekicha Yoshua ben Gamla, that when she became engaged to Yoshua ben Gamla, Minua Menach Liot Kohen Gadol, that the king appointed Yoshua ben Gamla to become the Kohen Gadol. Um, this is really fascinating. We're going to see more about this betrothal, 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 betrothal in a second. But the idea that she's married to the Kohen Gadol. Um, is amazing. And you wonder, the king, was the king interested in Yeshua ben Gamla, or was the king more interested in Martha ben Baitus? In other words, is it that Yeshua ben Gamla was going to be the Kohen Gadol and she married him, or was it that once he married the richest woman in Jerusalem, he got the job of becoming Kohen Gadol? We'll come to that in a second. Pamachat. Nikhlasa pamachat li rot. Ramra elech ve'ere otom kashe ukore biyom ha-kipurim bebeit ha-mikdash. We all know that the key day of the high priest is Yom Kippur. And it seems that she didn't used to go and watch him on a regular basis. But there was one Yom Kippur where she said, you know what, I would like to go and see him on Yom Kippur. And they put out carpets. They laid out literally the red carpet from her house all the way to the entrance of the Beit HaMikdash so that her feet not be, right, exposed. Here's a woman who's not used to leaving the house. She's not used to leaving her mansion. They have to actually take out Yom Kippur and carpet the entire route to the Beit HaMikdash. And when her husband died, she outlived her husband. They gave her a allotment of two siyah of wine, which is a huge volume every day. Um, right? And but don't we say you don't be usually assign wine to a woman? Um, and they go through all of this. The assumption being that what did she need it for? That she was that her wine was a basic foodstuff. And let's see the last story of her death. Amar Rabbi Elazar ben Rabbi Tzadok, skipping down a little bit, Rabbi Elazar ben Rabbi Tzadok said, er er ben achama, may, I not, may I live to see the consolation of Jerusalem if I did not see her hair tied to the tails of the horses as they dragged her to her death from Jerusalem to Lod. 
and I applied this verse to her, again, the same verse. She who is most tender and delicate among you, so tender and dainty she would never venture to set a foot on the ground, shall be grudged the husband of her bosom and the son of her daughter. Again, according to this, Martha Bambitus becomes a symbol, a symbol of the terrifying fate of Jerusalem, because look how she dies. According to this, and maybe it isn't her, because how can you have three stories about the death of a single woman? Um, but what we have here is a story of her death, where they deliberately took the aristocratic women, tied their hair to the tails of horses, and ran through the streets until obviously they died from battery and from their skin being ripped away from them. And um, this is what we have. story of Marta Butbitus. And what I want to uh, say is, this is reading number one. If you read through the Gemara, you wouldn't, you'd read it, you'd say, ay, 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 this is just so terrible. However, I think there is a subtext, and it's a subtext that we can get, both from what we know about her, and um, in other places. And also by reading the story. Already I see in the, the chat here, which I know I said I wasn't gonna read, but um, somebody writes that Martha must have caused a lot of extra work, presumably for regular people on a fast day on your Kippur. She could have declined the special treatment and I would agree with that a hundred percent. And there is no doubt that there is another side to the Martha Ben Baita story. And let's take a look at it a little bit more looking at the a few other bits of backstory about this woman. And here you see in source number five, to Amar Asi, how did Martha Ben Baitus's, Martha Baitus's husband become the high priest? Our Asi, Tirkava de Dinare, a whole purse of dinar, Ailele Martha Baitus, Yana Malka, Aldukme de Oshua Ben Gamla, Kane Ravrave. She paid a purse of dinari, some people say a million dinari, to Yanai the king, so that he would appoint Yoshua ben Gamla as the high priest. Oh gosh, here we have a situation where her husband doesn't get the high priesthood by right, but he gets it by her buying her way in. I'll give you another example of something they say about her son. They tell a story about Martha ben Vitus's son, Usually, by the way, um, when you have the sacrifices, they are divided up into many, many different uh, sections, and a different Kohen takes each section to the altar. But it says that the son of Marta Babaitus would take the two thighs of a large ox, which are obviously very, very, very heavy, Shelakuach Be'elef Zuz, bought at a price of 1,000 Zuz. Right? Remember, we know uh, that a Dezabin Abba betray Zuze, that a, 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 a goat, a kid goat, cost two Zuz. And he would walk heel to dough. In other words, he would walk in a very slow and stately manner. Umalach akeb betzad gudal, velohi nichwa akonim lasokheim mishum barov am hadrat melech. And the brothers, the priests wouldn't let him do this due to the royal, the, the rule with many people is the honor of the king. In other words, there was an argument between the Kohanim where some Kohanim um, wanted to, how should I put it? They wanted to grandstand. They wanted to show off. They wanted to stand there striding all alone. Obviously, by the way, this guy, Marta Vatbaitos, not Miriam, but Marta, lived in high Roman society, as we've heard. And it's almost as if this son is engaging in almost an athletic, athletic feat of walking slowly through the people, through the through the Azara, where everybody watches him and um, could see him. Yes, possibly the son himself was the upcoming Kohen Gadol, who knows? And um, the Konim say, no, this is not the right way to run the temple. We should share the goods around. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly where to go, how far further to go with this, but you know, maybe I'll tell you another very frightening story about this particular um, group of Kohanim. And let's take a look at source number seven. And again, I feel that these sources are pretty appropriate because even if Marta Barbatos was part of the aristocracy, and even if she wasn't a particularly nice lady, I still think we can see stories like this as highlighting and giving a window into the tragedy of Jerusalem. But we might see this story, and remember, the proof text that they keep on quoting for her comes from the Tochacha. And the Tochacha says, essentially, that all this trouble, strife, famine, and terrible, you know, devastation comes as a result of our actions. Let's take a look at source number seven, the Gemara and Pesachim, and then I want to go back to the story and do a, something of a, a literary um, a literary reading of it. The rabbis taught the first, they used to take the skins of the sacrifices to the chamber called the Beta Parva and the Beta Mikdash. And what they would do is they would divide it up to the Beit Av. There were certain groups of Kohanim, for particular, we have the Kina about them that we said this morning, 24 groups of Kohanim, and they used to come up for two weeks a year to do their Miluim, and they'd all be there for the Chagim. And they would each be in certain groups, and they would divide the skins of the animals between them. So the skins obviously were very valuable. However, there were certain people who would muscle in on them and use violence to seize them. So they said, okay, well, if these ruffians come along every night, let's do it collectively every Erev Shabbat. There'll be more people there and they won't come along. Now we find out who the ruffians are. Who were the ruffians? Okay, the the gedolei kahuna, the chief priests who seized them by force. And so, what used to happen instead of donating them to the kohanim, amdu baalim of hiktishum ashamayim, a person who would bring sacrifice instead of giving the donation of the skin to the priests, he would then say, "I'm donating this to God. These are hekdesh, and therefore, I no one can have them." In other words, uh, the, the temple didn't know what to do with all of these animal skins and eventually they would sell them off and bought loads of gold until the temple was covered with gold from all of this. Whichever way, we who are these violent Kohanim who create this situation? And it says, um, I'll go to the end. It was taught, Abba Sha'ul said, there were sycamore trunk tree, tree trunks in Jericho and men of violence seized them by force. Whereupon the owners arose and consecrated them to heaven as well. And it was of these and such that Abba Sha'ul ben Botnik said in the name of Abba Yosef ben Khanin. And here is the, the phrase I'll show you in the Hebrew. Oili mi beit baitos, oili mi avatan. Woe is to me from the house of Boethus. Woe is to me because of their clubs. Woe is to me at the house of Khanin because their whisperings. They maybe Lamal Shinim, maybe they tell the authorities. Woe to me is the house of Katros. Woe to me is because of their pens. They write letters to, I don't know, the authorities, etc. etc. For these are high priests and their sons of temple treasurers, and their sons-in-law trustees, and their servants beat the people with staves. This is already getting exceedingly nasty. This is not only wealth and disdain for servants who have to put out heavy carpets on Yom Kippur when the servants themselves are, are fasting. This is not only paying your way to the high priesthood. This is not only having a son who wants to grandstand in the temple. But here we're talking about violence, taking uh, the skins of the animal because you want to get wealthy off them and using violence, clubs, staves, in order to 
create a violent environment. These are the families of the high priests. What's going on here? This is, this is just awful. You know, when you go to Jerusalem and uh, you, I think sure many of you have walked through the old city to the Kotel, uh, you pass by something called the Burnt House. In the Burnt House, they actually found in the Burnt House a, um, a cup, and the cup on it says Katros. Katros is the name of one of those families of high priests. Just across the way, underneath the Shiata Kotel, they have excavated and they find these phenomenal mansions, each, of course, with mikvaot in the basement. Not just one mikvah, but many mikvaot. And that leads us to indicate that these are people who would eat all their food in sanctity. They would eat truma, they would eat ma'aser, they would eat kochim. They would... And these are the neighborhoods of the aristocracy, of the high priests. They could look out their windows and see the temple because they're right on the edge of the hill, right? But now we actually can see the homes and we can even imagine Imagine somebody having to put carpets all the way down to that valley by the Kotel and then up the stairs, which went up into the temple. We can almost imagine the distances. We can almost picture it. And this is Marta Bat Baitus, our, our, I don't know what we want to call her, heroine or, or protagonist or, or whatever we want to call her. So, here we're seeing that on the one hand, on a first read, this is a story of woe and a story of tragedy, but what are we exactly going to say? And here, of course, I think people have already understood that, I'll go back to the sheet, that we're telling a tale here of somebody who has never walked outside. She has this let them eat cake attitude. The whole country, the whole city is under siege. The enemy are coming in. The, there's a rush on flower and she's she's like she's like sitting there listening to reordering the the well her servant is like the person reordering the deck chairs on the on the on, on the deck of the titanic she's still having uh, her wondering what the menu is going to be for dinner that night she has no clue what is coming there's something tragic about it but there's also something so atum so i don't know covered in covered in silk from it all of that she can't even imagine. By the way, why does a servant keep coming back to her? All the time, each time, I, and I said, it's like a bumbling black comedy, but I, I think it's more than that. The servant's terrified from his mistress. If he doesn't come back with the best food from the market, he gets eaten. that. Maybe he himself will get beaten. Maybe he will get, this is not a very sympathetic woman. And therefore he makes sure, and he doesn't dare come back from the market. If she says, get fine flour, she gets fine flour. White flower, white flower, but she doesn't dare do anything without a permission. So he's constantly coming back to get his to get his marching orders because he's terrified about what um, what she's going to say and what she's going to do. Um, and of course, the, let me deal with the three versions of her death. Version number one, of course, is that she touches a piece of manure, a fulfillment of that pasuk. Um, but I think, of course, we have the contrast between this woman whose foot has never touched the ground. Even on Yom Kippur, when everybody is barefoot, right? Don't want to imagine. She is not enough for her to be barefoot through the streets, right? She has to make sure it's not enough for put on a pair of maybe cloth shoes. She has to have carpets. She never goes anywhere on carpeted and it's exactly this lack of exposure that suddenly when a foot hits the harsh reality when it hits the manure suddenly it's like this earthquake in her life it's this total earthquake in her life and she embodies this sense of the absolute she's she's stuck inside she's stuck inside she's inside a well she's inside a palace she she's 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 totally not exposed and that shows the insensitivity of maybe she's the contrast to those three great um wealthy men we heard about before not demon ben gurion who was happy to use all of his wealth to provide the jerusalem with wheat and barley for 21 years. And we had Kalba Savua, 
who was going to provide the wine and the oil and then Sister Rakesa, who was going to provide all of, they were happy to give. She's not giving, she's taking. She's all about her standing. She's about making sure that her husband is the high priest. Her son's got this sense of it's all the way we look, right? And her own servants are a violent group who strike fear even into the sacred temple. So here we definitely get a sense that there's something very awry about the world of Martha Bartabitus. The second version of her, and of course, by the way, the irony is that she ends up, of course, throwing all of her gold and silver into the street. There's the sense of everything which is thrown away, right? Um, whatever you find in the street. So we'll talk about that in a second. The second comparison or the second story um, is this idea of um, the con contrast between Rabbi Tzadok and, and Martha. Because let's again look at Rabbi Tzadok. Some report that she ate a fig left by Rabbi Tzadok and became sick and died. And what's Rabbi Tzadok? Because Rabbi Tzadok observed fast for 40 years in order that Jerusalem might not be destroyed. Here we have the wealthy and the people who eat all the time and they only eat the finest and they only have the most beautiful stuff in Rabbi Tzadok um, is already fasting 40 years in Jerusalem. She's not doing anything to make sure that Jerusalem is not destroyed. She's totally ensconced in her, in her mollycoddled environment, in her wealthy environment. But he already 40 years is somebody who is praying and fasting. He's not eating so that Jerusalem might not be destroyed. And he became so thin that what he ate and he ate anything, the food could be seen as it passed through his throat. When he wanted to destroy himself, he then bring him a fig and he'd suck the juice and throw it away. How did she die? Right? Because she ate the fig. She's allergic to Rabbi Tzadok fig. Rabbi Tzadok and Martha are polar opposites. Martha is totally insulated. She is all about the outside. She's all about the image. She's all about her carpets, her clothing, her insulation, right? Rabbi Tzadok is all about the inside. He takes the juice and he, um, he, he, he discards the actual outside. He's all about the inside. When he eats, you can actually see it going down his throat because he is so gaunt. So Rabbi Tzadok, you can see his insides, but there's this concept in halacha or in ethics of tocho kufaro, somebody whose inside is like his outside, that they're so genuine, they're so thorough. But if, so Rabbi Tzadok is all about the inside. She's all about the externalities. And therefore, um, he's the opposite of Martha. And I'd say even more than that, Martha can't even see two yards in front of her nose. She has no clue when there's no flower, when there's no brown flower. There's no... Eventually her, her moment of her death is when she steps out of the door of the house. She can't look outside. She can't look beyond. She certainly can't look ahead. She can, and she's again the contrast to those wealthy men who foresaw the future and were happy to insulate Jerusalem for 21 years. She, you know, of course that 21 is three times seven, seven being the classic amount, three men times seven. Um, and she can't see, she can't see what's coming around the corner. Rabbi Tzadok, on the other hand, 40 years before, is already predicting. Not only is he predicting, but he is trying to um, fend off the terrible korban by his own starvation. He's trying to fend off starvation and death by his own Spartan lifestyle where he's going to plead, pray and plead and live in this environment whereby he can save the city. So we see this tremendous um, contrast between all of them. Um, is, the, is, the, is the sound back? Are we, are we okay with the sound? The sound is a little choppy. I assume it's something on your end, the transmission from Israel, but I don't know. It's I can you can hear. Pay attention. I think for for Tisha B'av, it's you know, it's it's appropriate on Tisha B'av the sound be a little bit choppy. It's going to be, but uh, usually okay. it's fine. Yeah. 
I hope Please I for my end, I, can I don't know other people, but go ahead. Hold on a minute. I'll... Clearly, yeah. I mean, it's rare, but these things do happen occasionally. Of course, it happens to happen. We have the most people we ever have all year, but okay. <laughs> Rabbi, you okay? Okay. I don't think think this is... No. No, just go go on as you were doing before. I was trying to get back on. Yeah. Just go ahead. I hope this will help. Uh, I don't know if this is any better. No, I would say it's worse. What's now? You have to talk a little more. I'll, uh, I'll, uh... Okay. All right. I uh, let's uh, go. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the final source. And the final source, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop by share. Maybe that's what I'll do. Um, one minute. Okay, I apologize about the problems with the sound. Uh, I meant to have a very fast system here. I'm not quite sure what happened with the sound, but I hope that this will uh, make things a little better and easier to hear. Um, and what I want to do is just uh, read the last chapter as well, and uh, the, the last source as well, source number eight, which I think you probably have in front of you. Um, and uh, what you can see is that these stories aren't necessarily about one individual person. Because if I read the final story that we have here, the final story is um, seems to be very, very similar to the others, but it's almost like a variation on the theme. Uh, let's take a look at what we have here. Um, if you take a look at source number, the, the final source on the sheet, oh, I'm just getting my place, um, source number eight. Rabbi Yudha related in the name of Rav. It once happened that the daughter of Naktimon ben Gurion, and now you see a different woman. Remember Naktimon was granted by the sages an allowance of 400 gold coins in respect of a perfume basket for one day. In other words, when they decided on her ketubah, they put in that she was allowed 400 zuz for her perfume just for a single day. And she said to them, she cursed the rabbis and says, May God give you those allowances for your, your own daughters. And they all answered, Amen. In other words, she was so used to living, uh, you know, with designer standards, with the most expensive brands, things that the rabbis could never even imagine. And she was insulted. And they were like, yeah, please, if only. Our eyes thought it once happened that Rabbi Yochum and Zakai left Jerusalem riding upon an ass. We all know Rabbi Yochum and Zakai survived the Khorban while his disciples followed him. And he saw um, a girl picking up barley grains in the dung of the Arab cattle. As soon as she saw him, she wrapped herself with hair. Apparently she didn't have any clothes on. She had such tatters. The only way she should cover her modesty was wrapping herself in her hair. And she stood before him and said, Master, she said, feed me. And he says, my daughter, who are you? And she said, I'm the daughter of Naktimun ben Gurion. My daughter, he said to her, what's become of the wealth of your father's house? Master, she said, is there not a proverb, proverb in Jerusalem? The salt of money is diminution. And when the master said, where's the wealth of your father's house? This one came and destroyed the other. Um, Do you remember, master, she said, when you signed my ketubah? I remember, he said, that when I signed the ketubah of this unfortunate woman, I read therein a million golden denarii from my father's house besides the amount from her father-in-law's house. And the Gemara then continues and gives the same story that we saw with Nakti Monben, with Marta Ben Baitos. And you know what really happened to her? Eventually they tied her hair to the horses and that was how she died. Um, what we see here in these stories is just the phenomenal wealth on the one hand of the people of Yerushalayim, but the fact that they are insulated from the problems of the common people, that they live on such a high standard that they really had no clue what was going on outside their front door. And the minute that they leave their front door, they die because they can't cope with the shock. And here, um, I just wanted to maybe finish 
But lots of people have examined this story and have said that in the classic, uh, you remember we're talking about Roman times. You look at the classic Roman tragedy. In the classic Roman tragedy, there are four stages of the tragedy. Frequently, the story is about a person who is a protagonist, the hero, frequently a king or a prince or somebody who's high up in society. Stage two, right, is where the tragic the figure has a tragic flaw, right? They have a, 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 a flaw. And in this case, it might be, you know, indeed their, their hubris, their corruption, their violence. And then we have, of course, the punishment, the nemesis, right? Where the downfall of the hero, this is the classic story of tragedy. And usually the classic Greek story has to have the individual recognizing their flaws, recognizing, doing tshuva. That's exactly what we have in this story. It's almost written in that Roman style because you have Martha Babaitos so wealthy. Then we have the fact that the food's running out and she can't catch up. She's got no way of surviving in this rough and tumble environment in this desperate um, rush for food. And of course, um, what we have here at this point is we have the story with um, her throwing her, the retribution of course is her death in some way, but before she dies, she takes all her silver and gold and throws it into the street. And that throwing of the silver and gold is the opposite of Rat Sadok throwing his, his, uh, his fig out. She's throwing the silver and gold because it has no use to her. And she has realized at some level that it is her silver and gold which has made her deaf Deaf to what's going on around her, deaf to the poor people, deaf to the Koanim of Jerusalem, deaf to the suffering of her servants. And that it was actually the Koanim themselves and their corrupt behavior which brought about, or is at least party to bringing about the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is the story of Martha Baitus, text and subtext, a terrible, terrible tale. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure I don't, you know, I'm going to, I think the story speaks for itself in so many ways. I'm not going to articulate um, messages and therefore we can all learn um, and we should all do this and we should all do that. This is a day, I'm not sure it's a day for me to be giving any Musar, certainly not Musar to people from communities who live far from me and I really don't know intimately, but I think we can all think for ourselves about the sensitivity about the inbuilt structural, um, uh, how uh, uh, paradigms which are within our community about the need for all of us to be able to open up our hearts to all sorts of other people around us. And if we do some of that, then maybe we will be able to bring about a reversal of the Khurban and a journey towards Gula. Thank you very much and a good fast to you all. And hopefully we'll meet on happier days. And uh, maybe I'll just end with uh, hopes and prayers that the current uh, violence in Israel, in Gaza, uh, comes to a very swift end. There's a lot of talk about ceasefire tonight. And uh, as we say, Shalom, Shalom, Yerushalayim, we pray for the peace of Yerushalayim. That's true today, uh, maybe even more than just every other day. Thank okay. you, Rabbi All Alex. Right. You, you want to take there? I think there are a couple of questions you may not have addressed. You can spend a minute or two on that. I, I know there was a lot of. Uh, I see right right at the end. If you want to see Stephen. Ah, okay. Stephen. I apologize about the sound. I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, it could be, you know, just sometimes uh, that's what happens. Like it's beyond everybody's control. It's, you know, how the international uh, lines work. So, although I, I will say if somebody sent me an email to recommend that it might be better. I want to thank, you know, you know, Shalom sent me an email to that. If he says, if you call in on the phone, sometimes the phone sound like better. I've never done that, but you can try that on the Zoom link. There is a phone number for people to call. I, I, I recently, it was I recently yeah. I recently changed my computer system and it was meant to be much, much faster and it's doing much, much less well. Anyway, here we go. 
Um, Stephen asked the question, it seems like there are two traditions about temple era, sinfulness, one about Sinat Chinam, and clueless materialism. Are these dueling interpretations? I don't know. There is a Gemara in Mesechet Brach, I think, uh, Shabbat. Shabbat. I'm, I'm forgetting now. Alma Charva Yerushalayim, with a whole series of explanations, why was Jerusalem destroyed? And there are a huge number of interpretations and explanations about what led to the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and I think that each of these different agadot, each of these different tales uh, and legends takes us into a different sort of like framework. And um, so I don't know if they're dueling interpretations, maybe they are. Um, some of them do seem to be connected to historical, but you will find in the rabbinic tradition, you know, tens, tens, if not, you know, certainly tens of interpretations of what led to Jerusalem. Some of them have made it more famous than others, like the Sinat Chinam one. Um, but this, certainly what I presented there today, uh, is one interpretation. If I may add to that, if I may, I, to, since, uh, I think clueless materialism, as he puts it, and Sinat Chinam are two sides of the same coin. When there's too much materialism and money and fighting for everything, it's going to lead to Sinat Chinam. I think the two are, are deeply connected. But um, anyways, okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, thank you, Rabbi Alex. You can go eat in five minutes. And then, yeah. And uh, okay, okay, Rabbi. Good fast. Yeah, we'll start in uh, about three, four minutes. Rabbi, Rabbi Gedalia Berger, if you haven't had the pleasure of hearing him, he's going to be on this side of the Atlantic. Um, so he will be speaking on actually the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. He teaches at um, at Chipats. Uh, he teaches at the, the OETZ Halakha program. And uh, he's uh, he spoke once, Parsha, and he was very, very good. So he should be on in a couple minutes. And uh, I know he actually told me he had a funeral, unfortunately, this morning, but he's- I'm here. Oh, you're here. Here you are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Should have simchas. Okay, let me just make you co-host. Are you in as Gedalia? How are you in? Gedalia Burger. Okay. We're going to let people take a two-minute stretch, and uh, then we'll get started. Okay, Rabbi? <laughs> 